This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, a teapot, a sewing needle, a folding camera, all are touched by murder. Now, here's a handkerchief, a khaki handkerchief, a soldier's handkerchief, it's a common enough sort of thing during the war. A handkerchief, Stark. Fairly clean, if a bit mouldy. That would be from exposure, Thompson. Looks like army issue. It is, but no hero used it. You can bet on that. Well, that handkerchief can be seen today in the Black Museum. the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. at the Black Museum in Scotland Yard. Just come into this silent room. Outside, the Thames is busy with London's river traffic, and just upstairs, police communications tap from the teletypes, ring from the telephones. But here, as I say, is silence. Now, here's a length of garden hose. Once it was connected to an exhaust of a car. From there up through the floorboards. The time was winter. The driver rode with all the windows closed, and the car crashed. The man died. It wasn't exactly an accident, no. It was murder. Here's a German Mauser war trophy heavy gun. Strange, a tiny woman held it with two hands, smudged her own fingerprints. She was found out. Her hands gave her away. The paraffin test, you know, for gunpowder smoke. Ah, there we are. Here it is, the khaki handkerchief. Originally, it was intended for camouflage. Fairly shouted for recognition at the right time in the wrong place. Yet the trouble first appeared is the commonplace ringing of a telephone. Hello? Mrs. Lyons? Yes? This is Liz Hart. How are you? Oh, fine. And you? All right. I'm a little worried, though. Kathy's so late getting home. Is she with Doris? Well, they're not here. I thought Doris was with Kathy at your house. Oh, dear. Now, where have they got to? Oh, probably stopped at one of their friends' houses. Now, don't you worry. Kathy will come home with my Doris, and both of them will be full of... So stories. ordinary, so commonplace. One mother worries, the other doesn't. And later... Around six, the warrior, Mrs. Hard, Kathy's mother, speaks to her husband. You'll have to speak to Kathy when she gets home. Isn't she home? It's practically dinner time. And I thought she was in her room. She's off somewhere. Oh, John, I'm so worried. You call the places where she might be? Hours ago. No one's seen her. Well, we'll have to wait until 6.30. Then I suppose we'll have to start looking for her. Oh, when will Kathy learn to let us know? 6.30. No Cathy, no word from Cathy. This time the telephone rings in the Hart household. Mrs. Lyons is calling Mrs. Hart. Yes. I assumed you'd call me if Doris turned up with Cathy at your house. Oh, dear, I wonder where they can have gotten to. A frantic Mrs. Hart cradles the telephone, looks to her husband. Together they leave the house, go out into the darkening street to ring doorbells. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I'm trying to find my girl. But the Carters haven't seen Kathy. Excuse us, old man, but our Kathy seems to be among the unaccounted for. No, the Bradleys haven't seen Kathy. Sorry to bother you. Have you seen anything of our girl? No. The Corbetts 
haven't seen Kathy. Oh, please. I'm almost frantic. Where's my arm? No one. No one has seen Kathy. No one's seen Doris. Word is getting around now. The rumors spread. The time grows later. All of Penn, rustic Penn in Buckinghamshire, is buzzing now. At the inn, the tap room is crowded. Closing time draws near. Still, no word. Uh, Penn Inn, landlord speaking. Oh, this is John Hart. Look, Lyons and I are together at my place. Do you think some of the men would help us start a search? Well, I'll ask them, Mr. Hart. I'm sure they will. Now, you stay right where you are. We'll be along very soon. Can I have your attention, men? Your attention, men. Hart and Lyons need help. They want to start a search. Now, how many of you fellas will help? After all, neighbors and neighbors. And if we can't. So help... it begins. The long, hard search continues. It's six hours now they've been missing. It's dark, very, very little moon. The lanterns of the searchers move around the village of Penn through the fields and the clumps of trees in ever widening circles. The men beat the fields. At the hard home, two mothers wait and wait and wait. Yes? Nothing yet, dear. Try not to worry. Oh, nothing yet. The sun rides high above the fields and woods of Buckinghamshire. The sun passes its course, descending behind the hills to the west. Already the searchers, hundreds of them now, have moved outward from Penn, some four miles outward. The night is coming on. The doorbell rings. Yes? Uh, just on my way to the inn, ma'am, for more lanterns. And just to tell you, we'll keep at it all night, if need be. And there's nothing yet. Night again. Now the police are in the search, and with them a group of soldiers from a nearby camp. Steadily, monotonously, the men work their voices, subdued with the lanterns, bobbing and weaving over the countryside. Outward, always outward from Penn. Five miles now, six miles. As the radius lengthens, there's more ground to cover. False dawn grays the sky to the east, and the morning star low in the west begins to pale. Over here, mate! This way! Hello! <sighs> you found something, matey? I found something. Yeah? Covered up believes they were. Just... Just behind me here. Yeah. Found. The weary men brought the terribly tragic news back to Penn. In the little wood with its running stream where the bodies were found, two of Scotland Yard's inspectors, Thompson and Stark, took over together. Now was the time for professionals at manhunting. What have we got, Stark? Not much. Barely anything to go on. Gas mask container. Wooden. Out near the road. I don't think they were killed here, do you? No, chances are against that. One of the men brought me this. A handkerchief, Stark. Fairly clean, if a bit mouldy. That would be from exposure, Thompson. Looks like army issue. It is, but no hero used it. You can bet on that. There are tire marks and an oil patch over to the right. Truck tires. Double rear wheels. Army truck, it looks like. Plaster casts. The men are making them now. Army truck, army handkerchief. Anything else? Not yet. All right, let's get out of here. We've got a killer to find. They know the routine, these two. But grimly, they set about the work. Stark takes the gas mask container, the plaster casts, the handkerchief to the experts at the yard. Thompson stays on in pen. He visits a different kind of yard. Doris and Kathy were once my pupils, Inspector. I have a very personal reason for wanting to help you. But just how can I? It doesn't need me to tell you, Miss, how observant children can be. Now, it occurred to me that some of the kiddies in your school who live near the Hart's home might have noticed something unusual on their way back from school. 
course, it's only a shot in the dark, but a child might remember something that a grown-up would forget. I see what you mean, Inspector. Right, then. Now, who in your class lives near the hearts? Let me see now. Linda Carter. Oh, yes, and Kenneth Bradley. They're playing just over there. Come with me. Now, then, what's your name, young lady? Linda. Linda Carter. And yours, my lad? Kenneth Bradley, sir. I understand you two both live in the same street as the Hearts. Yes, sir. I live next door. Kenneth's a couple of houses down. Right, Kenneth? Yes, sir. Now, I know you'd like to help me if you could. I think your teacher told you I'm from Scotland Yard. She sure did. You... you don't look like a detective. Detectives usually don't look like detectives. Now, let me tell you something. We're looking for a truck. A large, heavy truck. An army truck, maybe? Maybe. Why, did you see one, say, day before yesterday? Yes, sir, at the crossroads, just standing there. Oh, I saw it, too. It, it was a big one. Oh, anyone in it? And just the driver. He had an awful red face, and he had glasses on with silver rims. He was sitting there smoking. Can you tell me anything about the truck? Yeah, I... I no, I, I just remember the man in it. It looked like a wireless truck, but it didn't have any aerial. There were those big double wheels on the back, and a number 44 on the door, and a red and blue square on one side, and the tailboard had some letters. J.B., I think. And on the front bumper, there was Bat C.P.M. Battery C. Prime Mover. Uh, anything else, Kenneth? Not that I can think of, sir. No, sir. How old do you think the driver was, Linda? Oh, 26. <laughs> you seem very sure. Did you ask him? Mm, no, sir. But he looked about my father's age, and Daddy's 26. I heard him say so. Thank you, Linda. You too, Ken. You've been very helpful. When you come to London, I'll see to it that you're shown through the yard. You'll like that, I'm sure, eh? Inspector Thompson sought out his colleague Stark at Scotland Yard. I've got good descriptions. The truck and the driver. How about you, old man? Laundry mark and the handkerchief. Print on gas mask container, that's all. Anybody seen them in the truck? A man and a woman, about a mile apart, along the line from the school towards where, where they were found. Any numbers in the truck? Battery, regiment, and division insignia. That laundry mark's going through the mill. H2503 is being checked in every laundry in the county of Buckingham. Good. I'll get onto Army Intelligence. We'll find that truck, the outfit that uses it, and the man who drives it. A leaky axle drips oil, does it? We'll see about that. <laughs> Well, that handkerchief can be seen today in the Black Museum. Now it was routine except for the unforgettable sight of leaf-shrouded bodies in the wood. The mechanics of tracing a laundry marker, routine. The preservation of plaster casts of tire marks, that's routine, grim routine. With an inevitability about it, pursuing the routine, Inspector Thompson called Army Intelligence and spoke with a colonel whose main function was liaison with the civilian police. Those are the details, Colonel. Well, uh, I have it all down. Large number, 44, red and blue square, JB on the tailboard, yes. battery C, PM on the front bumper. That's it. Sounds like one of those Fords and 6x6s we've been getting for our field artillery. I'll call you back, Inspector. Thank you. Like war, crime detection is largely a matter of waiting, waiting for information, waiting for results when the wanted alarms are sent out, waiting for a suspect to appear at a certain place. And now Thompson and Stark waited for answers to their inquiries. In a matter of hours, the answers began to come in. There's a report on the laundry mark, Thompson. It ties in with a series given an army outfit stationed about five miles outside of Penn Village. It begins to fit. It begins to fit. Patiently and grimly, the two men went on waiting. Once again, the telephone. Inspector Thompson here. Colonel Gardner, Inspector. I have your information. Here he comes, Stark. Good. Go ahead, Colonel. That truck apparently belongs to the 44th Battalion, Devonshire Blues. 
A battery C prime mover. Where is that outfit, sir? They've been in camp five miles outside Penn Village. They've just been moved to Yoxford on the south coast for further field training. Thank you, Colonel. Shall I advise the CO down there to expect you? If you would, it should take us about, about two hours. You move fast, don't you? I'll tell him. And good hunting. Hope you get your man. Thank you again, sir. If he's still with that outfit, we'll get him. If he's still alive, we'll get him. Yoxford, Stark. Get a car and a driver. We're going to the country. Traffic was light and gasoline rationed England. Some two hours later, Thompson and Stark conferred with the major commanding the battalion. Yes, we do have a prime mover with a leaky axle, gentlemen. As a matter of fact, it's in the shed just outside. May we see it, Major? Yes, of course. This way. I have the tire cast, Stark. Good. And our accommodations are still a bit primitive. No proper garage facilities. We just moved into this setup day before yesterday. We understand, Major. You've been having much trouble with that truck? Oh, yes, yes. A few days ago, just before we broke camp near Penn, and that's over in Buckinghamshire. Yes, we know the place. Uh, we released the truck to the maintenance depot. Apparently, there isn't much they can do with it. The main differential is a problem. Ah, well, there we are. JB on the tailboard. Have a look at the inside, will you? I'll take the tires and the markings. Check. 44 on the door, yes. Big enough, but I could hardly miss it. Red and blue square. Uh, our battery shoulder patch, Inspector. Yes, I thought so. Markings all checked. Let me see now. The tires. Now, oh, fall in here, Thompson. Yes, tires checked with the cast stock. Well, we expected that. Here's something on the top wallet. What do you make of these stains? Want a guess, old man? Oh, your guess is as good as mine. And it'll be confirmed by pathology. Blood. I think we're through here, Major. Maybe go back to your office, please. Blood on the tarpaulin, crumpled up and tossed into a corner of the truck. I don't think they were killed here, do you? No. Chances are against that. No blood around here. But blood on the tarpaulin in the truck. The two detectives and the Major went back to the orderly room. Oh, I think we'd better see the driver of that truck, Major. Oh, yes, of course. Um, Sergeant Carroll. Yep. Do you know who drives the prime mover for Battery C? Oh, uh, that'll be uh, Driscoll, sir. Oh, where is he now? Oh, I expect he's in the battery day room, sir. Oh, bring him over, will you? Uh, with his gear, duffel bag, the whole outfit. Yes, sir. The sergeant turned and left. The Major, with Thompson and Stark, waited silently, each busy with his own thoughts. An army is a cross-section of the population, they say. And if this Driscoll did this thing, part of that cross-section, I suppose. That blood stain. I hope there's enough for pathology to type it. Lawn remarks. His shirts and underwear ought to have the same mark as the handkerchief, if he's the man. In the day room of Battery C, the situation was normal. The sergeant walked in without attracting too much attention. Oh, here you are, Driscoll. Well, what's up, Sarge? You are. Major wants you. Well, what's wrong now? He didn't tell me. Let's get over to quarters first. For well, what for? Major wants to see your gear. All of it. Oh. Let's go. Was the waiting over? Out of the seeming anonymity of the army, had they found their man, and so quickly... In my office, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Oh! Can I just go, Major? Thank you, Sergeant. Dismiss. At ease, Driscoll. Thank you, sir. This is Inspector Thompson and Inspector Stark, Scotland Yard. They have some questions, Driscoll. Answer them. I'll try, sir. Well, he's all yours, gentlemen. May I examine your duffel bag, Driscoll? Of course, sir. The blouse is rather wet, isn't it? Caught in the rain, sir. Must have been quite a rain to go through the pockets like this. It was, sir. You're sure you didn't wash it yourself and pack it before it was dried? No, sir. It was the rain, sir. How do you explain the shirt, the cuffs cut off like this? Came back from the laundry with the cuffs all frayed. I cut them off. I only used a shirt around the track, sir. I see. Driscoll, does this handkerchief look familiar to you? Like any other handkerchief, Inspector. Thompson. The laundry marks. Here, collar of the shirt. I see it. We'll try again, Driscoll. Look at the laundry marks on the shirt and on the handkerchief. 
seems to be yours, doesn't it? I wouldn't know about laundry marks. They're identical, aren't they? Have you had a handkerchief like this recently? All the army issue is the same, sir. We get a lot of trouble getting things back from the laundry. Someone else could have had this handkerchief. Oh, rather a careless laundry, Driscoll. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Have a look at this tarpaulin, Driscoll. Yes, sir. What's your guess about those stains? Grease, sir. That shape? That colour? Might be blood, sir. This tarpaulin comes from your truck, Driscoll. I never saw the stain, sir. Might be someone swapped this one for mine. Driscoll, where were you on the 19th, three days ago? Maintenance depot. Repairs. Leaky axle. Did they repair it? Well, they couldn't. Not in the time we had before we moved down here. I see. Anything else, Stark? Not at the moment. Major, we'd appreciate it if you'd hold this man under escort. There are still a few inquiries to be made. Yes, of course, Inspector. Oh, Sergeant, in here, please. <laughs> There were still the loose ends on identification on the laundry problem. Driscoll wore horn-rimmed glasses. Inspector Thompson asked some more questions. I see, Corporal. He wore army issue and suddenly he bought himself the horn frame. You joked with him about it and he didn't like it. Grew angry, did he? Inspector Stark visited the regimental laundry depot. No complaints from Gunner Driscoll about losing things for him. Never tore or frayed his shirts. I see. Thank you. Stark stayed with the shirt. A battery made of Driscoll's had noticed the missing cuffs. The night you rolled in here, you noticed the cuffs missing. That was the night of the 20th. Very good. Inspector Thompson turned up an interesting item. Say that again, Sergeant. The night we came in here, we heard about those two in the woods. We were shooting the breeze about it in the day room. All at once, sir, uh, Driscoll looks around and says... Uh, Ten to one, there's a murderer in here. That's what. And once again, a telephone. Yes? Oh, it's for you, Inspector. Thank you, Major. Inspector Thompson speaking. He did? I see. It's been checked at criminal records. Good. Very good. Yes, of course I wanted the word at once. Thank you very much. They found something? The crew we left at Payne turned up the second gas mask container. Metal, this one, had a print on it. They checked in criminal records. The fingerprint belongs to an Oscar Driscoll. Served a term eight years ago for molesting and impairing the morals of a minor. Oscar Driscoll, you're under arrest. The charge is willful murder of Kathy Hart and Doris Lyons... On the afternoon of October the 19th. Well, that handkerchief can be seen today in the Black Museum. The defense, of course, was insanity. The defense tried to prove that Driscoll suffered from schizophrenia, split personality, that he had no recollection of what he'd done and therefore no legal responsibility. The jury brought in its verdict and finally... This man died at the hands of the public executioner. There was apparently no doubt in the minds of the jury that this man had known and planned exactly what he'd done. At any rate, the khaki handkerchief remains in its usual place in Scotland Yard in the Black Museum. And now, until next time, till we meet again in the same place, and I tell you another story of the Black Museum. I remain, as always, obediently yours.